Hospopreneur. Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of the Hospopreneurs podcast. Today I'm joined by Luke Davies, who is a bar manager at Family, Family Nightclub Club in Brisbane. Welcome, Luke. How you going, James? Nice to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, that's good. It's great to have you in. Uh, I'm looking forward to today's episode. Um, got a lot of questions banked up and I would love to delve more deeply into the nightclub scene. Uh, sorts of the sort of the, the highs and lows of of the nightclub scene because this is where a lot of your experiences, as I know, has been. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, but very much so. So, so I like to start. Uh, so the last episode, I started off with uh, with a question that I'd like to sort of uh, maybe use every episode, and that's I was I want to know: Have you got any crazy bar stories? Crazy bar stories. Um, yeah, <laughs> there is definitely a lot of them. Um, I don't know, a lot of them are, actually, I don't know, a little bit gross, just so it's like drunk people sometimes are gross. Yeah. Uh, or initiation kind of thing when you're back in the glassy days. Yeah. As most Anything you're happy to share, what would you like to share? Um, <laughs> probably, probably, okay, my initiation probably. Yeah. Um, so about two years ago, I was glassing or our stock manager at the time. And I'd done a little bit of glassy work, but it had mostly stayed in stock in the bars and stuff like that. So I think I mentioned uh, the idea of like, so for people who aren't in the industry, glassy is like a, a bus boy, like someone who picks up the glass. Yeah, yeah, so pretty much your job is yep. go around, pick up the empty glasses, yeah, cool. clean them out, and you have the lovely job of cleaning the toilets, which that's this right. story goes on to. Uh, yeah, and that's where most people start in the industry, right? Yeah. So. Which I find is very good. Like I would prefer, especially hiring bartenders, to have bartenders that have been glassies before, just so they know how, or they have to deal with the harder parts and the worst parts of bartending before mm. they go straight into the, some some say the easier job of bartending. Yeah, it's totally different. Yeah, I remember like transitioning and after being a glassie, you know, you you're out there running around, going up and down stairs, you're carrying, you know. I did started just getting into winter too, so for me it was you know carrying the the gas uh, canisters yeah. as well the you know, the gas bottles and it's like two of those full and oh man it's it's hard those glasses have it hard but then when I moved into the bar my calf muscles started getting really sore <laughs> really sore because you're constantly like lifting up over the bar but, but sorry to interrupt your story please 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 continue Luke uh, yeah so uh, at family we kind of. All of us that have been glasses kind of have an initiation story that's like something will go terribly wrong and we'll just find a new guy to that has to go deal yeah. with it. No, that feeling. Um, so I can't remember what the act was on that night, but it was a really busy night. Mm -hmm. And we get a call one night that one of our stalls, like toilet stalls, clogged up. We go in and, of course, being a busy night, the toilet stores, let's vomit on the floor. Yeah. We lift up the toilet seat and the bowl is completely full of vomit. Uh -huh. we're, we're like, okay, we need to unclog this because it's only halfway through the night. So they call me in here and we're like, right, initiation. Yep. You've got to unclog this toilet. That feel. I'm just standing there in the toilet, like, floor's covered in vomit, the toilet's like overflowing in vomit. So you yep. got to. Get your plastic bag, like, yeah, full up your sleeve. Did you uh, rubber glove, oh, sorry, plastic glove and plastic bag? Yeah. Most definitely. Yeah. So, rubber glove, two plastic bags. Like, rubber glove, or did you plastic uh, glove? Plastic gloves. Yeah. 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 Uh, a double bag, just in case one gets a hole yep. in it. Um, <laughs> yep. So, <laughs> I, I got one after this for you, yeah. <laughs> Keep going. So, the, the vomit in it was so thick, like, you couldn't see into the toilet bowl. You couldn't see anything oh, down there. So, gross. it was reaching and hoping nothing was in there. Um, and get to the bottom of the toilet and of course there's a glass stuck in the bottom of the yep. toilet that you have to pull out. Just like naturally went in to grab the glass and there's something inside the glass. Yeah. Nice and squishy. Um, pulled it out and somebody's tasting it, taken a nice big turd in Dude, the glass. my story is the same. <laughs> yeah, Shit, keep I, going, keep going. I don't know what goes through people through people's head when they're like, yep, let's stick a let's stick a glass in the toilet and then take a dump on top of it. Yep. Anyway, so um, <laughs> there was a security guard Are behind. Are they glass glasses or are they plastic glasses? No, actual glass glasses. Glass. Oh, yeah. man, that's rough. Yeah. Uh, well, so there was a security guard behind me just to like make sure nobody goes into the stall while I'm cleaning it. <laughs> and no one I, else takes a crap in a glass <laughs> yeah. while you're in there. 
Um, and I, I literally just have this glass in my hand and I turn around, and full turn in the glass and just turn around and he just looks at me and he's like, you need a pay rise. Yep. It's like, never, never cleaning toilets after this. Yep. And that, so that was the, my initiation. Yep. I never had to clean the toilet after that. I got put into, <laughs> put into stock management. So. Oh man, you were lucky. Yeah, I was like... I had to do a really bad one, but I, at least after that, I never had to clean it again. Oh man, my situation uh, was very, very similar. That's that's an awesome story. Oh man, a disgusting story. Uh, very similar to mine, but I think yours trumps it. Mine didn't have quite as much vomit, but it was very similar. It was basically glass clogged in the toilet. But dude, get this though, our toilets where I was were just the right size so that the glass squeezed in and you couldn't get your finger around the outside to pull it out. So, man, so I had to do like a little, you know, like <laughs> spider, you know, like reverse spider. I'm trying to explain it for, for our listeners. Rever- like, you know, spread your fingers to get on the inside of the glass to pull it out to sort of twist. It. Oh, man, it was, that was rough, but and, I had to clean it. And you don't want to be that. too, you don't want to be like too rough because otherwise you might rip the plastic bag yep. that's over your hand yep. and then you get everything in yep. your hand. So. Yep. It's, oh, a, it's definitely trusting the plastic bag. Do not want to think about that. I'm actually going to give you a cheers today as well. Cheers. cheers. We've got uh, got a couple of drinks here today. Um, doing uh, yeah in a in a, a nice a nice room closed off to the side of a of a bar um, that uh, Luke's very familiar with. Yeah, it's a uh, very nice. Uh, we're in a Jumanji bar. Yeah, man, you can mention it. No problem. Um, so yeah, it's Heya Bar. It's one of my favorite bars to go as, especially as a bartender. Just because the staff here, they're literally all veteran or mostly veteran bartenders and it's just a really nice place to go where you can come into the venue and meet 20 other other bartenders from around Brisbane, have a fun game at pool. And yeah. It's a, it's, I find it's a really cool dive bar, but then yeah. you've got the kind of the club scene here too. Yeah. So it's really awesome. Really good place to, to hang out. And it's, yeah, I, I like going to a venue, especially like say on a Monday night after you've had a busy weekend. You don't really want to deal with the whole patron side of things. Yeah. You've dealt with them all weekend and you come into a bar like this and it's just bartenders. And of course bartenders are never gonna be shit and That's uh, right. never never gonna cause trouble. So you all kind of get each other and never don't cause any trouble for each other. So it's a nice change. Yeah. Oh man, I, I love hanging out with bartenders. Um, and they know how to party too. I think bartenders party harder than any person I've ever seen on a Saturday night at their hardest, you know, yeah, like when, munching on their own When you face. see a bartender on their night off, it's definitely a force to be reckoned with. Definitely. Um, man, so my next question, Luke, is I wanted to ask what your background is. So, like, did, did you study or, you know, how did you, you know, get into the bar scene? Um, so, I actually started real early in bar scene, not in, like, pubs or anything like that. I actually started in cafes mm-hmm. um, back when I was 14. And I started as like the barista side of it, just making like smoothies and coffees and stuff Mm. like that, but just love being behind the bar. Um, And because we're in a quieter restaurant, like once a month you'd get a cocktail or something like that. But every time somebody would order a cocktail, even if I was out on the floor, I would like beg the bartender, I was like, let me make this cocktail. Like I love making cocktails and all (laughs) that. I just wanted anything to get into the bar. And so after about a year of working there, they finally like started putting me in the bar, started training me for the bar and stuff like that. Um, at this same restaurant, it was like, oh, I, I was still in school, so I thought it was a good idea to pick up a Sir 3 in hospitality, as most kids do. It's like pretty much a free subject at school yeah. and you get your RSA and all that with it. Um, and that was pretty much my stepping, stepping board into hospitality. I haven't really left since I was 14. Yeah, Just, I love it. I didn't get into the nightclub scene or the pub scene um, until I was about 17. 17, mm-hmm. I worked in a little bar out in Victoria Point called Elysium. Mm-hmm. And it, it kind of opened my eyes to, after like obviously being 17, I've never been to pubs before. Yeah. And it was kind of like the smack band in the middle of a nightclub and a pub. It depended yeah. on what night it was. Like, it's like where I was at Stockies, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. So, it was, after working there, it was just like, I love working in nightclub scenes. It's just like the music, the scene, and just like going the in, energy. Yeah, it's like going yeah. into work. Everyone has just like that high energy. Yeah. Everyone's happy and stuff like that. So that's what got me hooked with it. It was like, 
why would I sit in an office all day and work in an office where yep. you can go out, have fun, and get paid for it? Definitely. And it's like you get paid to party. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't seem like... No. That, that is a... <laughs> like when you're unclogging toilets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that that's one of the things that annoys me when patrons come up to me and it's like, oh, your job's so easy. easy. Like you get paid to party. And I was just like, yes, it's fun and stuff like that. But you, there's still like a, there's a dark side to it yeah. as well. Got to be up way later than all you guys as well. Yeah. I'm going to delve into a little bit of that later. Um, pretty soon, a little, a little bit later on. Um so thanks for sharing that. My, my experience is quite similar. Um, so I started in, uh, my first hospitality job was actually at Boost Juice. So I was making a lot of smoothies. And that, uh, you smell great after you work at Boost Juice. You smell like fruit. You honestly do. Like, I had a great time working in, in a smoothie bar. It was beautiful. Um, but uh, yeah, and then uh, cafe, I worked in an Italian restaurant. My first bar, I worked in food and beverages at, uh, at, at a hotel, large hotel chain. Um, and yeah, then eventually made it in the nightclub sort of scene myself. And now I'm over in a cocktail bar. So uh, crazy, dude, crazy how these things sorts of, ha- these sorts of things happen in you and you evolve and, and you really love it. But did you, um, did you study as well or no study or um, what did you do? Yeah, so uh, I moved out of home uh, around when I was 17. Mm-hmm. Um, I studied nothing to do with hospitality, but I studied audio engineering. Yeah. Um, it's kind of just a hobby through school, stuff like that, and decided to take it further. Um, I haven't really taken anywhere, taken it anywhere after graduating, just because I've delved pretty much headfirst into hospitality. Yeah. Seeing a career path in something that I loved. Yeah, dude. Um, I decided to go with that instead of with my degree. I'll probably still uh, pursue my degree later on in life, but at the moment, like I love love bartending and love, I, now that I've moved into the management side of it, I've found that you can actually make a career out of this and making a career out of something you enjoy going to work every day, why not? Hell yeah. Do you think that your audio engineering uh, interest or your interest in, is it in music? Is that what it is, your interest in music? Um, yeah, so I went in, I was a musical child, so I picked up many instruments and learned them as I was growing up and um, I decided when I was finishing school I'd prefer to like create the music and um, like mix it, produce it and stuff like that rather than play the music. Yeah. Still enjoy the whole music side of it, but I'd rather be the producer and make like yeah. the final product out of a band. Yeah. But yeah, uh, do you, that can wait till later on in life. <laughs> that's okay, dude. I mean, you can do it concurrently as well. I mean, I was going to, the reason uh, I, I was sort of asking a little bit about that was because I was wondering if that has sort of influenced your interest into the nightclub scene as well, obviously having heavy electronic music in the scene, could that be influencing your decision to be like, hell yeah, I want to be around all that music? Most definitely, yeah. yeah. So um, when I was going through the uni, uh, going through uni, I was most definitely focused on like drum and bass, dubstep, um, all that type of music. So when going into a a big nightclub where I work and some of the acts that you were doing uh, assignments on and stuff like that would come into the club and actually play and it's just like that's so cool I've that's done really an assignment cool. on you like three months ago and yeah. you're playing and I'm talking to you right yeah. now so, yeah that's awesome um, I've definitely taken it into maybe just like a, a deeper enjoyment of just because I know how what goes into making that music um, and stuff like that but I haven't really thought about going don't really have an interest in going into DJing or anything like that, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, it's sort of, uh, I was just interested to explore more into, you know, uh, what what it was that really attracted you to the nightclub scene. You talked a lot about the, the high energy and the, the vibe and everyone's having a good time. And that's what's great about hospitality. Yeah. I, I find, in fact, I got an, an incredible piece of wisdom from a gentleman named Jags who owns a, a cafe in Melbourne called Two Birds or Two Birds, One Stone. Uh, in South Yarra, fantastic, went there last July, and he said to me, he said, he's an incredibly wise man, he's not, even, he's not even old, incredibly wise though, and he said to me, James, hospitality is my favourite industry, because it's the only, in, it's, well, not the only, it's the industry where you deal with the most happy people on a day-to-day basis, and I thought, shit, that is so true, any other industry, people are miserable most of the time, or they're yeah. like normal, you know, they're just like, baseline level normal, right? Hospitality, people are out to have a good time, you know? So it's about giving them that fantastic experience. So yeah. that's why I love it. Well, that's it, yeah. Going into work every day, 
it definitely, even if you're having a really bad day or something's gone wrong, you walk into a venue where you got a hundred people just smiling and laughing yeah. and having a good time. It's really hard to have a bad mood after, like, especially being in that kind of uh, atmosphere. It's yeah. really hard to be in a bad mood, and it seems to you know, just keep me keep me happy and keeps me excited. Awesome. Do you think that there's um, uh, this is sort of the potentially a darker side? I'm going to flip that onto a darker side here. So, do you think that being around all that high energy all the time creates these you know uh, unrealistic expectations for people in the industry to be always on this high? So when they're off, you know, maybe they have to, like I find a lot of people have to party even harder. And for me, I go the opposite. I'm like, when I'm off, I'm like docile. I'm just like, I switch off. Yeah, so that's similar with me. So if I go out drinking, if it's an event or something like that, I'll go out drinking and like party real hard. But if it's a regular night for me, just going out and having a couple of drinks, I much prefer just sitting in a dive bar, like the one we're in at the moment, yep. and just having one or two drinks with your mates, playing a couple of games of pool and just yeah. having a good chat. So I would much, much rather that on a weekly basis than um, going out and getting absolutely hammered. Yeah, because it's about that, uh, I suppose it's that, not, not uh, the first word that came to mind was dichotomy, but um, that, I can't think of the word. Anyway, you've got this stark difference between this high energy and low energy and I feel like to recharge, to be on when you're at work, I've got to, come down, I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, because a glass yeah. of wine at home. <laughs> That's what I do. I drink wine and think. Well, That's especially because you're seeing that every week at work and like, I don't know about you, but it gets tiring seeing people go, sometimes it gets tiring seeing the same people coming out and doing the same thing mm. every weekend. And you have your regulars. Yeah, they can come in and have a good time, but then you get the some that it's like they just come out and do the exact same thing every yeah. week. Um, and... Just to me, it's like I think that's a little bit sad, and yeah. like mix it up and do yeah. some, go to different venues, like try out the different things. Definitely, the oh, um, So when you said that, it actually made me think. Um, people, I've actually lost it while I was explaining the question. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let me move on to the next one, actually, because I've got something else. Because I remember you did a flare promo video a while ago. I actually wanted to ask you about that uh, a bit about that. So what was what was that for? Um, so we did that for B105, so B105 did a, uh, it was their R&B Fridays, mm -hmm. they did their anniversary, I think it was their second birthday. And they hit 105 now, is that right? The uh, yeah. radio station, yeah? Yeah. Um, and it was just a birthday party for them, so they paid all the, they got all the tickets sorted, like they did radio call-outs for who could get tickets and it was like limited entry. Cool. Um, and pretty much they came up to us when they booked our venue for it and said, we want you guys to do some flair. Like, we'll give you these signature cocktails or you guys can make up these signature cocktails that we'll sell on the night, but we want to come in and record them so we can advertise them like on our website and stuff like that beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> it was a bit daunting at first because um, I'm not... I'm not going to say I'm a professional flair bartender. I like to throw things around every now and then and just make it look cool. <laughs> Um, but yeah, when I got put on the spot for that, I was just like, damn, like I actually have to practice for this and like make sure I get everything right. Um, it did actually end up looking way better than I thought it would. Uh, it looked really good. Not going to lie. There is a lot of like post-production work that made it look better. I definitely <laughs> dropped things during it. That's right, man. Um, but yeah, no, flare bartending, it like it just makes it so much more fun. Yeah, man. Uh, well, uh, the way I see it is... When you're bartending, you have a like a you have a stage in front of you. Like you got a mm -hmm. crowd of people mm -hmm. standing at you, staring at you, waiting for a drink. Mm -hmm. Might as well make a show. It's like yeah. bartenders live off their extra tips, mm -hmm. and if you have like a crowd waiting waiting for drinks, they're yep. literally going to be standing there anyway. If they're entertained, they're going to yep. be happy to pay that little bit more. So um, I half, am the, miss that. half the time it's like, it's pretty simple. It's like all you have to do is like flip flick your tin around or yep. like toss a glass over your shoulder or something like that and uh, the people are going to be really drunk and oh That's my fine. god it's super impressive where did that come from yeah yeah do you have any other like little bar tricks that you do um <laughs> I do have a cheeky one and uh, <laughs> I'll let I'll let you guys know it uh, so it's <laughs> appreciate you sharing it with us everyone knows uh, you drink Corona with lime right mm -hmm. so you got to make sure your patrons uh Fairly inebriated for this one, otherwise they'll, 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 <laughs> they'll beat you out. Yeah. Yeah. So pretty much, you pop your, t 
pop the top off your Corona bottle and you have a lime in each hand, but you only get, you like wave one lime in front of them. Love it. And just keep them occupied and be like, hey, you guys want to see a trick? And while you're doing this, you have the lime in the other hand on your pop Corona and you just like Put hold it, it. Yeah. yeah, hold it around the lip and then hold in a fist around the top of the bottle so yeah. they can't see the lime. Wave the other lime around in yeah. front of your in front of your face and stuff like that to try and keep their attention. And you put the Corona bottle behind your back and just look up, get pretend like you're getting ready for it. <laughs> All you've got to do is make sure the lime goes straight behind your back yeah. so they don't see it before. Yeah, straight behind your back, pull the Corona bottle around. It's got a lime in the top. Yeah. Of it. Everyone at the bar, as long as they don't catch on to it, they're just like, oh my god. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love that one. That, oh, that is man. probably one of my easiest ones and short by a way to get you tips. Man, I, I love that one. I've got one uh, that I came up with recently that I learned on New Year's Eve. There was a gentleman who came in who was a friend of one of the bartenders. So I worked New Year's Eve at Brooklyn Standard and uh, in there, there was this um, yeah friend of one of, the, one of the bartenders there. He came in and he did this trick with this note. I just asked him to, you know, he was, he was paying for his drink and he did this little trick where he pretended to put it in the other hand and showed me and I was just so amazed by this trick. Like he sh did a trick with me, the bartender. I was like, oh shit. So I actually invented my own version of that trick and I actually do it with customers, but I, I adapted it so that it's got sound. I wish I could, um, I could show um, the listeners at home what what it is, but it's basically, I just put it in one hand, it looks like it goes to the other hand, and I'm like, oh, here you go. But put it in my pocket behind my back, the other one, and then go, yeah, I actually want to learn one with a card though. Yeah. Because so many more payments are with card, really, I find that people are just like, oh yeah, pound card, pound card. What I want to do is, this is, this is for, for you guys listening, I want to be able to make that card disappear and then be like, oh shit, sorry, I'm still learning the trick. I don't know how to bring it back yet. Like, I'm like, oh no. It's cool. Um, so, yeah. Do you have a spare card? Sorry, guys. Do you have another one? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Um, so, I've got to learn one with a card. I'm sure, you know, David Blaine or someone's got some trick out there. Um, but I love it. I, I think about it as a stage as well. Yeah. You're, you're performing. When you go out every night, you're, you're putting on a show. And um, I'd love to own venues one day. And something that I actually think would be really cool in a, in a club, and uh, this, is, this is for free, everyone who's listening. Um, I actually think it'd be awesome if we, if we made it more like a show and each part bartender is almost treated like a performer. So when they go on their break, for example, they're like, thank you very much guys. Look, I got it. I'm, I'm off. I'll be back in half an hour. And then, you know, it's like, oh, cool. I'll catch you later. Thank you very much. I'll be back. So it's like, man, it's just like a show. Like you're a, you're a performer. That's how I think about it. I definitely think it is one of the one of the bartending arts that is definitely lacking in Brisbane. Like I don't see why there is more flair, flair bartenders yeah. or it's not a sought after skill. Yeah. It's like it's even massive elsewhere. Yeah, it's like especially as a venue owner, it's like it will draw people towards the bar to where they spend money. Yeah. And if more people at the bar, more drinks through the till and Patrons are having fun. The bartenders are having fun. What's to lose? Yeah. Like, oh, man. It looks amazing. But uh, yeah. there is some people out there that I hear that they, they don't like flair bartenders. I don't get it. Me either. I yeah. like it. I'm personally a flair fan. I think it's fun. It's cool. It's And in the end, you know, if, if, if a couple of people are like, oh, you know, like the noisy people who complain about it, I think are in the minority. I think the majority of people are like, that's fun. That's cool. I wish, you know, they're like, oh, they're amazed by yeah. this, this show that's being put on for them. So, I love flair bartending, personally. I still have to get juggling down packed. Once I have juggling down packed, yeah. they'll, they'll be alright. Many be a glass has been broken trying to learn <laughs> juggling. So. Oh, man. Have you, uh, do you know how to juggle with just balls or apples or something? Uh, I can do it with limes. Limes? limes. Yeah. Uh, not quite with glasses yet. I, yeah. tried, I tried with uh, just tins, like your Boston tins. Yeah, that's hard. Boston um, tins are hard to juggle. Well, I found, I'm actually, just because I've learned like flicking around the yeah. tins and stuff like that, I know the weights of them yeah. actually better than glasses, so uh, it's easier for me to throw tins around than it is to throw glasses and lines. Oh, and a Boston like tin, for those who don't know, we'll just quickly explain what a Boston tin is. Uh, yeah, so when you see people shaking cocktails and stuff like that. Normally there's a clear side and there's like a metal shiny side. Mm -hmm. The tin, they're called Boston and tin. Uh, they mm -hmm. always go together, it's both your shakers. The tin 
most, or some bartenders use as just like an ice scoop mm -hmm. out of their well, so they're not touching it with their hands. But mm. it's pretty much your most used utensil in the bar. Yeah. You scoop it, ice into every drink pretty much. It, in a nightclub, it's one of the most valuable tools behind the bar. Yeah, you're literally you scoop using with it for it. every. You're literally using it for every drink, no matter what it is, as yeah. long as they're having ice with it. Yeah, and there are plenty of other kinds of, so that's just one kind of shaker. Yeah. There are other kinds of shakers as well, cobbler and whatnot. Yeah. Um, we only have the ones, the single ones, as we are not a specialised cocktail bar. Yeah, or yeah. the bar I work in isn't a specialised cocktail bar. We basically, basically uh, spirits and beers and mm -hmm. very like high, high intensity speed service. Yeah, yeah. Which, um, yeah, brings on a lot more. Uh, that I'd like to delve into maybe in future episodes as well. I've, I've got uh, some other questions here. I mentioned before that I wanted to explore uh, the idea of, you know, working, you know, sort of the, the difficulties of working in nightlife. I actually wanted to delve into uh, sleep. So, you know, getting used to that shift work and like the hectic hours can be incredibly hard, particularly to start with. And, you know, you're in a cafe, early hours, and then boom, you've got to flip to this nightlife where you're sleeping at, you know, finishing work at, you know, 3.34, 5 in the morning, come home, sleep at 6, 7, maybe even later. Some people like to kick, some bartenders I know kick on after work, sleep at 9 in the morning, you know. So um, how did you manage getting used to that? Uh, first tip, blackout curtains. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely blackout curtains. Yeah. And try and soundproof your room as much as possible. Um, I was lucky I uh, moved out with my brother, so... Having a housemate, but he also works in clubs. Um, we have very similar similar sleep schedules, so it's not like one of the housemates is going to be up making noise. We're both sleeping mm -hmm. at the same time, so I got lucky with that aspect of it. Um, but it did definitely take you take some getting used to of like being asleep while it's sunny. And like, yeah, there'll be light coming through your window. But honestly. After a, after a weekend working full shifts for a whole weekend, you don't care if it's sunny or if it's dark. Yeah, you're that just, tired. And yeah, you just crash out. <laughs> um, so true. The hardest part, I think, is uh, there was a period that I was working at a restaurant during the week and then working in the nightclub during mm. the weekend. Um, it's pretty much you have or well, I had my set days off as Monday, so I would work nightclub Friday to Sunday and mm -hmm. then I'd work at the restaurant Tuesday to Friday mm. um, and it's pretty much try and stay awake after work on Sunday stay awake through the whole day as long as you can and then just crash out and yeah. you wake up Monday morning um, you wake up sorry Tuesday morning try and sleep through the whole night and then your sleeping patterns kind of reset for the next week yeah and just rinse and repeat yeah it gets hard it gets very hard. Yeah. For me, I um, I didn't do the blackout curtains, but I did um, <clears throat> um, eye mask. I wear an eye mask and earplugs. Eye mask and earplugs, and I found that that's done it for me. I haven't needed a blackout curtain, but it is takes a fair bit getting used to when you know every single day the sun's coming up. You know, I actually adopted. A, I actually sleep. So uh, people might not know this, but I actually sleep at about six in the morning every day. I just that's just when I sleep now. That's just what I do, I'm just so used to that, that that's what I do. Um, I don't go back to a day thing. So I don't actually see mornings. Uh, I see the dawn, and then I'm like, cool, that's my alarm for bedtime. Instead of like a wake up alarm, and a sleep alarm. That is fun. One sad thing about working shift work, especially on the night times, sunrise does not feel like a special thing anymore. That's right, yeah. <laughs> You'll be walking out of work, work and the sun blaring in your eyes, and you're definitely not happy to see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, gee. But um, no, cool. Thanks for that. The the other thing I wanted to ask was because these uh, like the the nights do hinder a lot of things. Uh, I wanted to ask a bit more about that. I mean, I know that um, in my experience, I haven't been able to even date girls, for example, who work a nine to five job very well, very easily, because they're not awake when I'm awake. You know, and, and appointments and things. You know, we can only really do things in the afternoon unless you make unless you you wreck your I don't know. It make. It, I actually was doing the night and day. I used to. I was going to uni and doing morning lectures as well as working nights on the weekend. And I got sick so many times. Got like ran. I, you know, I, I got run down and, and and ill. And so I realized just maintain that schedule. Maintain the night thing. 
yeah. how have you done that? You know, like, did you find that hard or um, well, what comes to mind? I don't know. My, uh, my body's kind of got used to just napping. As when I'm tired, I'll have like two, three hour naps. I don't normally sleep full nights unless I'm really, really tired. Um, I just try and nap, sleep till I wake up, get up, do what I need to do. Mm. And then it might mean I go to sleep twice in a day. So I'll go to sleep in the morning, wake up at like 10 o'clock, even if I'm wor working that night, 10 a.m., sorry, i just to <laughs> clarify. Mm -hmm. Wake up at like 10 a.m., be awake for a couple of hours, go get lunch. That's actually really early for me. Yeah. Like 10 a.m. is really early for me. So when, when you say the morning, it's... And well, yeah, thanks for clarifying it because a lot of people have different ideas as to what the morning is. Yeah. Um, so some days, especially on the weekends when I'm working, um, I find it really hard to sleep through a whole day. So even when you come home from work, it's real hard to sleep through something my... Like I live in the valley, so... There might be a siren going past that might wake you up. Um, my trick is, as soon as you wake up, get up. Um, go do something, like do something around the house, clean the house, um, go out, have dinner or lunch or something like that. The normal um, human things. And then come back in like two hours or so when you start to get tired again mm. and go go have another nap. And then you might have another three, four hours sleep. So mm. you're still getting your eight hours sleep, but it's split up. And mm. I find if you stay in bed and just once you wake up, try just lay in bed till you try and fall asleep, you just end up more tired. Yeah. But you wake up at the end of it and you're still tired. Whereas if you get up and just do stuff until you're tired, go back to sleep and have another nap, you feel way better, way more refreshed, or at least that works for me. Mm. Um, so that's a couple of hints for you guys. Yeah, out there. thanks for sharing that. See if that works for you, but so it doesn't work for everybody, but definitely works for some people that's cool I have noticed it uh, with me adopting because I know there's many different um, ways you know that I mean, people talk, talk about circadian rhythm I don't know much I haven't actually explored the science of it too much but you know the whole thing where as humans when we see the Sun we're actually you know our brains like you need to wake up now yeah um, so that's why being dark is awesome um, but I've found for me so so and not but but and I've found for me having adopting almost like a Spanish model where I have less sleep in the night, but then have a bit of a nap in the afternoon, like 20 minute, 30 minute nap, 20 minutes is like a good period, 20 to 40 minutes peak. Otherwise you feel like you, you feel groggy and stuff. Yeah. And under that, you don't really feel rested. That works for me as well. I have a bit of a nap. And I find power naps can be anything under an hour, anything over an hour, you're going to be more tired than mm -hmm. you wake up. So Especially if, like, if you want to have a nap just before work, make sure it's less than an hour. Otherwise, yeah. you wake up more tired than you were when beforehand. So, and also, if you want to master the nana nap, get in hospitality. That's for sure. Um, because those, yeah, those crazy club days. That's for sure. I'd love to be in there again. I, I, I love the, the nightclub scene. But uh, but the next uh, section I want to explore with you, Luke, is um, is an area that uh, people don't really talk about a lot um, in the industry. Uh, it's it's quite big, uh, and so I just wanted to to delve into a little bit, and that's that there's like there's a massive drug culture in nightlife, um, and I just sort of wanted to uh, ask your perspective on what you've seen in the industry, um, you know whether uh, you find it's it's worse in the club scene uh, versus maybe cocktail bars or, or other areas that you've sort of uh, been to even as a patron or knowing people in the industry. Do you find that? Um, it's different sorts of drugs that people take, or you know, what's what's your perspective? Um, so, I definitely think there is more a higher presence of drugs, especially in the nightclub area. Uh, but also, you're dealing with a higher volume of people, so mm, true. More people, more drugs. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, but we, at my work, we definitely we have a no no um, tolerance policy. Mm -hmm. So anyone found with drugs, anyone found taking drugs, even under the influence of drugs, uh, we have a no tolerance policy. Mm -hmm. So kicked out straight away and anything that's found on them confiscated. Um, I do see some people abusing it and like going overboard with um, the whole drug taking and it's quite sad to see. Uh, but there is some people out there that are uh, responsible with it, but it's still we take a no tolerance policy on it. Um, there definitely is a difference between cocktail bars and night, nightclubs. Um, definitely not saying there's no 
no drug scene in cocktail bars. There definitely is, mm -hmm. uh, just not to the same extent as nightclubs. But again, you've got a whole different atmosphere between nightclubs and um, cocktail bars. You don't really go take a date to a nice dinner and then cocktail bar and that's right. want to get absolutely off your head. That's <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, and chew your face off. Um, <laughs> would make an interesting date though. <laughs> Oh, it certainly would. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, I know it's a touchy subject, but um, I want to explore some more things like this as well, uh, also in future episodes, um, because I think that these are the sorts of things that uh, we should discuss. I think these are things, you know, even for people in the industry, like a lot of hospitality workers uh, do take a lot of drugs, um, and you wouldn't even know. Some of them are, uh, obviously, there's zero tolerance at, at, at all venues. Um, but it does go fly under the radar a lot. So um, it's just something that I'd like to learn more about myself and, and, and sort of um, get this you know, information you know, symmetric, uh, symmetrical across the market, you know, across all, all people everywhere. I think that it's awesome for people to just learn as much as they can about everything. Yeah. Well, um, I definitely don't condone taking drugs while you're working. Yeah, um, I, do, I do know some people do. And honestly, I have no idea how they do it. Um, yeah. <laughs> when, when I'm at work, I, I need 100% concentration, um, especially when in, in management, like mm. anything can go wrong mm. at any second. And if you're not in your right mind, like, that can come off bad on you. So the, yeah. the amount of fines and stuff that are out there, it's just not worth it. Like, save mm. it. If you're going to do it, save it for your nights off. Don't do it at work. You're risking yeah. your job. You're risking... Like your livelihood, you're risking your savings and all that, and in some cases, you're risking other people's lives. So, if there's an incident that you need to be there and need to be taking care of it, and you're not in your right mind, that can risk other people's health as well. Mm. Um, so, I definitely don't condone it, um, and I try and, as you can probably see, advertise not to do it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, keep it for your spare time um, if you're going to do it. Definitely don't do it at work. Yeah, cool. Thanks for sharing that with us, Luke. Nice um, the other thing I wanted to ask was, so the family is rebranding. Um, Most definitely is. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, so it was a little bit of a surprise to us, to be honest. Uh, um, the family nightclub. Can we just tell people a little bit about the family, actually, about family? Um, yeah, so I've been almost four years with family now. Um, I came in when it was... Um, they called it Fampire, and it was um, sponsored by Night Party for oh, the Ministry really? of Sound. Oh. Um, it was running for the older crowd out there that's listening. Is uh, back when Rage Crew was running around in Family. Mm -hmm. Now more of like a dubstep kind of darker, darker scene kind of EDM. Mm. Um, but I was. It was only a couple of months that I was there until they re they did the whole renovations. They didn't rebrand. They renovated the whole club and spent, mm. uh, it was nearly five million, I think, on the re like restructure of the whole club. Mm. They literally ripped everything out of the whole top floor and redesigned it pretty much from scratch. Um, so after that restructure, it stayed as a Ministry of Sound Club, but went to a brighter, kind of a lighter side of EDM, so your trance. Um, can, can you explain that a little bit more? You said Ministry of Sound... What was the next word? Uh, oh, just so Ministry of Sound, they just changed to like a brighter side of EDM. Back from the, when they were um, vampires, it's kind of a darker dubstep. Um, so, so we're talking about music genres now. Yes, can sorry. We, can we just sort of explore a little bit more with that sort of, when you explain about those sorts of things, just so people are understanding yeah. you know, what you mean by that. Um, so, yeah, back in when it was... Um, Rage Crew and Back in Vampire. I didn't know a whole lot about it, but I just, the events that I saw when they came in, it was a lot more grungy, like you had your heavier music, mm -hmm. kind of, um, when you go to a festival and you've got your heavy bangers that are playing, mm. like that, that was the music that you heard all night. Yeah. And um, after the rebrand, it changed to the more lighter, lighter yep. music that still dance to and like still have a good time to, it's just not the real heavy drops, yeah. um, just like trance music, which is uh, like you're easy going, still dance, but like chill out dance kind yeah. of thing. Um, but yeah, that that stayed as so. Ministry of Sound is a 
pretty much a music label. The, they have a whole bunch of DJs under their belt and they have a whole bunch of uh, different venues that they sponsor and pretty much they're the musicians or the DJs that they have under their label go around to the venues that they've sponsored, uh, which was really cool for us because we get to see all the really big acts that Ministry of Sound has had. Mm. And um, yeah, they kind of come around. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there. That's right, man. That's right. I, I, I'm, thanks for sharing even a little bit on sort of the music side of things there. Because um, I'm interested to know, because the music industry has changed massively in four years, you know. Um, so you said the brighter side of music, you know, that brighter genre of, of EDM. I've actually seen, because Big Room House was massive for, for a while there. Trap was big. Trap was really big. Uh, dubstep and Trap. And then it sort of became Big Room. And now I, I don't really know what to describe it as now. I really don't know. Yeah, there seems to be a, a new fad that comes through. Yeah. Every... Side trance maybe yeah. coming in. We that goes on to what we're changing over to yeah. when we reinvent the tape. Uh, we're turning into a side trance or sci fi um, major venue, so they, right. they will be the major events we, that we will do. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I really don't know what the fad is at the moment. I actually it's think it's future, future house, future I think house, it's future yeah. house coming in. It's that like uh, it's hard to describe. I, I love future house, and um, that's what I'm DJing at the moment. and uh, well, that's what I'm, I've been playing when people have asked me to do gigs and they, they're like that. So, um, otherwise, it's the, che the basic cheese, you know, just chair yeah, that yeah, at its top 100 out. Yeah. Um, so, I think it's Future House. Future House is... So, to explain that, how would you describe Future House? Um, uh, the way I see it, I don't know if this is actually correct or not, but it's, the way I see it is people take house music and then create their own mix out of it. Still, it still comes across as um, trance, as in like easier, easier going music, mm -hmm. um, or laid back, laid back beats. There's no real big drops. There's mm -hmm. no like heavy bass or mm -hmm. anything like that. It's just like more laid back, kind of grooving, grooving music yeah, that yeah. you can just kind of chill out, sway along to, stuff like that. That's my take on it. That's, I don't actually know the... That's an interesting way to describe it because I, I sort of have a similar description where I think before, when we, when we think about house music, you know, it's kind of, it's got this really structured, um, you know, 8, 16, 32. I mean, all electronic music operates under that proviso, but it's got a really clear, um, almost framework or structure that people have taken and, and people, so many people were just creating duplicates of the same song and all these big room house songs sounded, or Melbourne Bounce was really big too, right? Melbourne Bounce, Future House, uh, Melbourne Bounce and Big Room, massive. Um, for those of you who don't know these, um, I might provide, I'll provide a link in, in somewhere to describe what these different genres are. Um, but um, yeah, they were big and people were creating duplicates and they're like, oh, everything sounds the same. Um, so there are a lot of complaints from, from listeners and other DJs or producers. I wish we'd make that distinction as well because actually I want to make that really clear on this episode because people who create the music are the producers, the people who play the music are the DJs and producers would get, and DJs in fact, some of the people would get very passionate about this. I've got a great mate who gets very uh, fired up if you say the wrong thing. So I'm glad I, we've been able to make that distinction. But um, Future House to me is a little, it's a little, it's almost a little dirty. It's like that little dirty element, but it's mostly deep. It's almost like Deep House and tra almost trancey, but well, it's still got that like... I definitely think it has, it's kind of like a mixture of all of them. All of them. They have parts of all of them mixed yeah. into it. And it, of course, depends on the producer or the DJ that's made the song. Yeah. But I find a lot of them, they, yeah, they don't have different different genres mixed into it and they stay to the rhythm of house but they have like your groovier part and then they have like dark parts as well yeah. but they stay to the, the same beat kind of thing yeah but almost that indie and alternative sound in a lot of these future house tracks um, it's almost like indie indie musicians that's sort of the genre that they're producing in house music now that's that's how I think thought about it anyway. But um, we'll we'll move on from music because um, we sort of sat on that for a bit there. Um, how 
so in you've you've, you've been in different um, types of hospitality venues, and then going into the nightclub scene, how have you found it going from Glassy? You mentioned after Glassy, you were in charge of stock, um, and then moving up from there. Um, you know, how do you make your way up in a nightclub? Um, patience, definitely patience. Yeah. Um, as I said, I've been there for a long time. Uh, the people might just be patient though, but you know, how do they actually go about getting, you know, someone could just work somewhere, but how do they actually? You know? um, so the main, main thing I had to do was just every job you get, work your hardest. Do your best at that job. Your superiors will see that you work hard. And on a, honestly with me, because there was such a high turnover in, because we're such a big venue, there'd be positions that opened up that are above you. And say you're, so say just as an example, um, you've got glassy, kind of the ranks go glassy, pack bar, stock manager, um, bartender, bar supervisor, bar manager, um, and then onto venue manager and stuff like that. So um, when I was a glassy, the, one of our back bars quit and mm. they're being a glassy, I'd work underneath him, I kind of knew what he did and only needed a little, little bit of training. Yeah. Um, and my superiors had seen that I'd worked really hard and I worked well with the team that were, that were in. So I just got placed in that bar, I got asked if I wanted mm. to do it. Um, there were some positions that I got asked if I wanted to do and other positions that I pretty much got told that I was getting moved into that position. Yeah. But um, pretty much just work your hardest, no matter what job you're doing. If you want to make it in that industry, industry just work your hardest and show that you're going to work hard. Because um, being a manager now, if I see a glassy that works his ass off um, and then I see a, a bartender that is slacking off all shit, I will demote that bartender down to a glassy and promote the glassy up to a bartender just because I know they're going to work hard. So I see, see if you're a hard worker, you will work hard in whatever you do. Mm. Um, and especially in high, uh, high speed venues and stuff like that, you don't want people that are slacking off or kind of dragging the team down. That's right. Um, so yeah. a weak link. Yeah. And it was like, you're definitely yeah. a team and, um, if somebody's dragging that down, it definitely you definitely notice it, and um, you probably won't stay long if you're dragging. You're the one dragging the team down. Yeah, something I've noticed with with bars is um is is that um we so in the scene a lot of people look at you know bartenders and glasses compare you know com basically compare themselves in different positions and, and like a ranking sort of pecking order. But I look at it like people are, you know, look at it as more of a flat structure and um, almost an ecological system where people are working together. Every role provides a different, uh, important part to the, to the machine, to the great machine. Most definitely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a bar, like I said, a bar would yeah. never be able to open without glasses. Yeah. And the same goes with bartenders, back bars. Like, Bartenders can't work without a back bar. Back bars can't work without glasses. Uh, vice versa. It goes all the way up the chain. Everyone, I, I don't like to see people uh, putting down like, glasses or back bars and stuff like that. Yeah. Saying they're beneath them because half the time, glasses work harder than bartenders and they, they do work really work. hard. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I try and keep it on an even level. Uh, mm -hmm. The only reason I said like entry level is glassy just mm -hmm. because um, most people when they start in, if they have no bar experience you put in as glassy first they the reason that we do that is so you can see how a bar works you see how the yep. bartenders work you see glassy menu in, works as well yeah. uh, glassy is really good because you're going through the whole venue you get to see the mm -hmm. crowd you get to see the acts you mm -hmm. get to see how all the bartenders work you see how all the management how the security work mm -hmm. it's kind of like um, you're getting paid to see how the whole venue works yeah. and then when you progress you kind of have an understanding of what everyone does that's right um, and I found that really helpful especially when I moved up to management when I uh, had to assemble a team or <clears throat> sorry um, or when I had to roster on certain staff mm -hmm. for different events I kind of knew what each person, person should be doing just because I 
worked in those jobs before. Mm. Mm. Um, so, um, in my it's my recommendation to if people are starting in the bar industry, you, no matter how much it may seem like it sucks, get a job as a glassy. Like it's going to help you out further on in the future. Um, and honestly, like it's good fun. You get to go through the crowd. You get to dance with the crowd. Yeah, and stuff like that make friends with strangers while you're picking up glasses. And <laughs> everyone says this. Like bartending, everyone says it's the easiest job to pick up in bartending. No way. Dude. Glassing is oh. way easier to pick up chicks than totally it is Totally agree. Totally agree. I met so many more people as a glassy because I had the opportunity to talk to customers. Exactly. I feel like glassies uh, are, or busboys or whatever it's called in, in your particular region, this, this role is really important because it's the only connection that staff have with the rest of the venue. You know, yeah. bartenders a lot of time are... They're, they're locked in behind the bar. They literally so you, see what's So your glasses, they go out, they go outside the bar. You know, they're, they're the people connecting, they're the staff connecting, you know, what's outside with, with the rest of the venue. So it's a super important role. I actually had one, um, I worked in a little cocktail bar in Melbourne uh, for a, a couple of nights called the Woods of Windsor. Fantastic place on Chapel Street. I highly recommend, awesome little bar and, and restaurant. And... The, one of the first things, I learned so much those couple of nights uh, working with Blake, Blake, Blake Hall, um, and he said to me, because I was bar back, and he was like, dude, you're not working for me, I'm working for you. You tell me what glasses we have, what we've got, you're in charge of the stock, it's you, I'm working for you. And I thought that's a really interesting perspective to take on it, because as a bartender, you just dealt this stuff. You know, if you don't have glasses, you don't have glasses, right? Yeah. So... Yeah, you don't have any glassware. You got to you got to handle it, and um, it's a really important functional role. Well, so that's it. As a, as a bartender, if it's a busy night, you don't see all you see for the whole night is three feet in front of you. Yeah, like, four faces. Yeah. you know, deep. <laughs> like yeah, if, if you have a full bar, all you're looking at is your ice well, your yep. <laughs> your speed well, and um, the <laughs> in front of you. Yeah, hey, people waving money at you. Most definitely. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I love that though. I live for that energy. Man, I love it. Um, for all the patrons out there, never wave money at a bartender. Definitely. Unless, you, unless it's a tip, never wave money at them. Yes. Yes. Take notes. Um, <laughs> Thanks for that, Luke. <laughs> no the, um, the next question I have, I only got a couple left. Um, I wanted to ask you how, so this one, is, it's, it's a little bit different. Um, how are you innovating in the industry? Do you feel like you're creating change or innovating or is there anything you're doing to leave your mark on the industry? Um, I try and leave my mark. Um, being a big venue and stuff like that, we do have a lot of um, like training uh, protocols and stuff like that that we have to train all our new staff. But um, being changing over venue and having like the whole relaunch and stuff like that, mm. Uh, I did get the opportunity to train a lot of the new staff and have my own, kind of like get my own team that, yeah. that I've trained myself. Um, so kind of in that aspect is like, I have trained all my bartenders, like all my bar supervisors to bartend to help my bartend kind of mm -hmm. thing. And just to, because the same person's training them, uh, they work it well in or I think they work well together yeah. just because they have the same mindset or they have the same base training yeah. um, that they're all doing the same thing uh, but as far as innovating goes apart from like my flair and, um, which is cool which I yeah. do yeah. Uh, apart from that uh, pretty basic uh, speed service that's cool man no but, interesting uh, I definitely make it my own like everyone makes does their own little thing at the bar yeah like you may see it as just serving drinks, but it might be the small talk you one, do with your patrons. One may. Not me, though. Absolutely <laughs> not. I, I, yeah. Oh, not at all. I mean, anyone can, anyone can, in fact, oh, I heard this recently, said very well, you, anyone can put beer in a glass, you know, but it's about the show behind that while it's happening. Exactly. You know, yeah. anyone can go, oh, cool, there's your, there's your vodka lime soda. There you go. But if you do it with pizzazz, energy character with you then that is something that people come back for and uh, I don't want people to feel pressured to do flair and stuff like that uh, 
serving somebody a drink with pizzazz and stuff like that may mm. just be the way you talk to the customer yeah. while you're serving them. Like, if they're there by themselves, you might just make them feel like they're having an awesome night. Yeah. Just, like, make, make them feel, like, part of it. You're happy that they're there and yeah. be part of the party. That's half of bartending. Like, no one wants to go up to a bar and have, like, a bartender that's not in the mood to be there or just, like, real grumpy, something like that. They're, if you're real happy, they're going to be real happy. Like, mm -hmm. like I said before, it's real hard to be upset or sad when everyone around you is being really happy so yeah the more people that are happy around you the happier you're going to be so you might as well try and make your patrons as happy as possible and it might just be a have a good night or like enjoy your night man and that can make somebody's night yeah and it puts a certain bit of personality onto that service yeah i think it's super important and people and i think people, it gosses over a lot of people you know this is this is what hospitality is about, you know, and, and yeah. well, I think, have, sorry, you sorry, yeah, on. well, um, you have an opportunity, you, you are literally talking to so many people in a night, mm. and it just puts that opportunity out there to meet a whole new world of people that you would never meet before, so say, I know somebody's on a trip, they're on holiday over in Scotland, mm -hmm. normally you would never have a opportunity to connect or talk to this person. Yeah. You say hi to them or how's your night going to this person? You might have a friend made for life. That's right. Just from saying hi to them, which you may never get in any other situation. Yeah. So it's just, you have that opportunity. If you're a social person, person, you have that opportunity to meet so many people that yeah. you would never meet before. And because the volume is so high, yeah. there's so many, so many people. That's why I love it because I love... I just love dealing with so many people yeah. day in, day out. It's like, bam, bam, bam. Oh, who else can I meet? You know, <laughs> who else can I provide an awesome experience for? I just, man, I love it. Okay, I, I don't know. I, man, I maybe there's something wrong with me. I don't know, but I absolutely love it. I live for that. That definitely brings me back to the whole. Um, I don't see myself working in a, in a different industry because yeah. of that exact reason. If you're sitting in an office, like. <laughs> Who are you going to meet? Yeah, it's like, you sit there staring yeah, at your screen all day. Such a small social circle around it. And then going into bartending, it's like all of a sudden, you know people from all over the world. Yeah. Dude, well, I'm, I'll, I'll share this uh, semi-reluctantly. I've worked in a lot of offices and I've gotten in trouble in a lot of offices because I used to get so bored and I'd go and get a coffee and... And I'd go to the coffee shop and I'd be like, man, this is where I need to be. This is the, this is what it is. Meeting, you know, just like having fun, having a coffee, having a chat with a stranger. Man, ah, oh, ah, oh, I just find the office life, the nine to five didn't suit me. And that's why I love hospitality. That's why I got into it. Props to the people that can do that though, because I definitely could not. Oh, definitely. Oh man. Anyway, next question. Last final, uh, final question to wrap it up. Um, is what any oh sorry what resources do you have you know that, that have helped you on your journey to become a bartender to become a, uh, the, the incredible bartender that you are Luke um, to be honest the staff that I work with yeah star like veteran staff are your most powerful resource you can get like speaking from their experience or what they've learned mm. um, there's only especially like if you're learning cocktails or like bar techniques and stuff like that, mm -hmm. um, it's far easier for somebody to show you than yeah. to read it out of the book. Um, and especially with like making cocktails and stuff like that, stuff like that. Yeah. if somebody makes it in front of you, you can taste it, you can see it. Yeah. Um, if you read it in a book, you're just like, okay, yeah, it has this, this, and this in it. You can make it up, you taste it, you have no idea what it's supposed to taste like. Um, especially when you're learning about uh, different spirits and stuff like that, because they all have different tastes. If you know, don't know what it's supposed to taste like, you're never going to know. So um, definitely for people starting in bars, definitely take advantage of um, the other staff that work with you or um, even bars around town and stuff like that. I've never, never walked into a cocktail bar where a bartender is not happy to share their knowledge. Yeah. There is, especially in Brisbane, um, you can walk into pretty much any cocktail bar and say, hey, I'm new to bartending and I want to learn about cocktails. 
they will sit there. Yep. You, you, you will have more trouble shutting them up yep. than they will getting them to talk. You have a good night on your hands if you if you go in like that too. You know, Most going definitely. in, a, a, approaching it as a student, you know, a student to the world. People always want to share their knowledge, and no matter at what stage, like I'm up to management now, and I'm still learning stuff. Like, yeah, I could learn something off one of my glasses, but just always be open to learn. Um, never think that you know everything because there will be situations that you've never been in before and that person mm-hmm. might have been in or they might have a certain technique to do something quicker which is a lot of bartendings around like time efficiency stuff like that yeah um, they might have a quicker way to do it because they're the, they're on the ground you know they're in the front lines exactly you know? yeah so they know what's happening they're like oh dude uh, maybe we should move this here and then boom, you know, you're like, shit, we can make it way faster. The whole process, say, cut time, there's all sorts of things. So never be too quick to shoot somebody down on an idea. Like, always have open ears, no matter what position you're in. Have open ears for, for what anyone else has to say, especially if they're, um, they've been in the industry longer than you. Or if, even if it's a new venue, even if you've been in the industry longer and you're in a new venue, like, they might have a certain way of doing what they do. But, that's one of, uh, one of my pet hates is uh, when you start come in and I understand if they have like their own way of doing something, but if that te- if the team that works in one venue has a way of doing something, they're going to work well as a team to do it that way. Yeah. Um, and like I said, like I'm open ears to what they have to say, but if it's detrimental to the team, like, yeah, yeah. make sure you listen to what your managers and stuff are saying because there might be reasons that you should do it that way. Mm. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Luke, for no being on the show. That was a, an awesome long episode today. Um, thank you at home for or, or in the bar or wherever you're in the car, wherever you listen to this podcast. Um, thank you for listening in and please subscribe on SoundCloud or iTunes uh, and reach out at hospopreneurs at gmail.com and follow the Instagram page that's Hospopreneurs. So the, hands, the handle is at, yeah, Hospopreneurs. So thank you again, and we will speak with you soon. I'll, uh, I'm looking forward to the next episode. And the coming episode's got a few coming up, really exciting episodes coming up. So thank you and cheers.